Hello, in this video we're going to talk a little bit about Plato and Aristotle, and we're also briefly going to talk about Alexander and the expansion of the Greek culture. So, Plato was one of the most important mathematicians and philosophers. He lived in Athens. He was uh, born in 427 BCE and died in 347 BCE. He was one of the most important mathematicians and philosophers of all times. Uh, the word Plato means the broad, so it may very well have been a nickname, possibly referring to broad shoulders or broad forehead, or perhaps even just his broad intellect. Uh, there's some evidence that his real name might have been Aristocles, or Aristocles probably. Uh, he was friends with Socrates. In fact, a lot of what we know about Socrates is through the uh, dialogues of Plato in which Socrates is uh, a major character. Uh, he lived in Athens, but he did travel. He traveled to Egypt, Sicily, and Italy, both seeking out knowledge and to make political connections. Uh, Pythagorean ideas definitely influenced his work, and his works were often in the form of dialogues, so they were basically recorded conversations uh, between two people, or hypothetical uh, dialogues between two people, where they each espoused certain ideas and made certain arguments. Again, this is how we know a lot about Socrates, because we think a lot of his arguments were uh, probably what he actually thought, and these were recorded in the dialogues. Uh, it's a little hard to know exactly what Plato thought about certain things because uh, he never comes out and says, I think this, he has them, uh, these ideas uh, fleshed out in these dialogues. But he contributed to a lot of areas of knowledge, dance, music, poetry, architecture, Drama, ethics, metaphysics, philosophy, the philosophy of mathematics and politics, rhetoric, logic, and education. So uh, he thought of mathematics, uh, the objects studied in mathematics as pure objects, representations that are, in, are, are then imperfect approximations. So for example, uh, you know, a line, segment, uh, that we might draw down uh, if we try to measure its length or, or, or note just the representation of it alone is, uh, is a, some sort of approximation or representation of a line segment. An actual line segment was a theoretical construct that had no thickness and but had some exact length. This is the way we still think of mathematical objects today. Um, he's not really known for his own direct computation contributions to mathematics itself. Uh, he was he was a proficient mathematician, but not necessarily a groundbreaking mathematician. But he is probably more important for his contributions to logic, which I would argue is, is a central part of mathematics, and then also for placing mathematics at the heart of a good education. So, as we've mentioned in earlier videos, the um, Greek mathematics was often, or Greek knowledge in general, was often taught in uh, schools, and these schools uh, grew up centered on uh, different uh, particular individuals, and Plato's school is probably the most famous of all. It's called the Academy. It was uh, founded in Athens. And it existed from 387 BCE to 529 CE when the Christian Roman Emperor Justinian uh, closed it down because he thought it was um, contrary to Christianity. He thought it was pagan. Um, notice that that, that uh, particular academy outlasted Plato by quite a while. Uh, and that run of that length of time being open actually makes it the longest uh, continuously serving institution of higher learning uh, in history. 
Now, the word academy now uh, represents um, a learned place, right? But the word academy then actually was a place uh, in Athens. It was a park and a gymnasium. And so um, his academy would have, his, it was the school at Athens, really. And, but it was located in this area called the academy. And so now the word academy has taken on uh, a much uh, more prominent meaning because of Plato's school that was there. It is said that, that um, there was an inscription above the door to the school that said, let no one who is ignorant of geometry enter here. And uh, the idea there is that um, if a person didn't understand the basics of geometry, then they couldn't understand the basics of logic. And if they didn't understand those two things, they couldn't learn anything, basically. So Plato had a curriculum at his school, and uh, it placed the mathematical sciences uh, front and center. The exact sciences, arithmetic, plain and solid geometry, astronomy, and harmonics would be studied for 10 years to familiarize the mind with relations that can only ap be apprehended by thought. Five years that would then be given to the still severer study of dialectic. And dialectic is the art of conversation, of question and answer. And according to Plato, dialectic skills is the ability to pose and answer questions about the essence of things. The dialectician uh, replaces hypotheses with secure knowledge. And his aim is to ground all science, all knowledge on some unhypothetical first principle. So this uh, idea of an axiomatic approach to, uh, to everything. The academy... Uh, then became a major center of learning, probably the, the best of, of its time. And it brought uh, most of the prominent mathematicians uh, in, the, uh, in the Greek world then, at some time or another, were passing through the academy, either as students or teachers or both, or visiting lectures or whatever. They, they often came there. Uh, uh, Eudoxus was there. And uh, he was very prominent. Uh, Thaetus was another one that was there that was also very prominent, probably two of the more prominent mathematicians, much more prominent than, than Plato himself. Uh, but, but he was able to bring all these folks together. So again, it's not so much uh, Plato's um, uh, contributions directly to mathematics, but that he was able to make this academy elevate mathematics to be the pinnacle of what you would study and or at least the basis for what you would study and then bringing together all of these prominent mathematicians so that many advances were made there. Uh, the Probably the most famous person other than Plato himself, well probably even more than Plato himself, to go through the academy was Aristotle. He was there 20 years, first as a student, then as a teacher. He never actually became the head of the school, uh, but he was there uh, still to, to, this, to the end of the school. He's the most famous member of the school, most influential member. Uh, the school, of course, was in Athens, which is where Aristotle spent a good chunk of his life. Uh, Aristotle lived from 384 BCE to 322 BCE. He was born in the province right next to Macedonia, and his father was a physician. So in his early years, he was trained a lot in, in uh, biology and uh, um, things that, that would be a physician. So it would be typical for a physician to take this secret knowledge that they had of the body and illnesses and so forth and healing and to pass that down to his son. So he probably got some early training from his father year there. His father died young, however, and uh, then uh, eventually he, he went made his way to uh, Athens and studied there at the academy and then stayed there at the academy, like I said, for about 20 years. Uh, after the death of Plato, uh, Aristotle left the academy. And he returned 
actually to Macedonia to the court of Philip, who was the ruler there. And he became the tutor of Philip's son, Alexander. Now, it's not clear whether he left because Philip asked him to come to tutor his son. Uh, it looked like maybe that he and Philip maybe were, were friends and maybe about the same age and friends together. Uh, it could be that he left because he didn't get appointed the head of the academy, which he wanted to do. Uh, but in any event, he ends up at Macedonia. And there, uh, among other things, he ends up tutoring Alexander, who becomes an extremely important figure in history. Uh, <clears throat> about the time Alexander starts to take over or took over the throne uh, of Macedonia, um, Aristotle moved to, back to Athens. And this time he founded his own school that is called the Lyceum. And at the Lyceum, he studied, or he studied and he taught a broader range of subjects than were studied at the academy. So uh, in addition to the things that were all studied at the academy, they taught things like politics, ethics, epistemology, uh, physics, biology, uh, in addition to mathematics. And his basic, biggest contribution to mathematics was really his contribution to logic. And he codified a lot of different ways that uh, we use for logic. He used syllogisms a lot. And that is where they would, uh, statements that were that were logically true, that like if one thing is true, then another one has to be true. And so he, he codified these different types of logical arguments. Uh, he used the word axiom to be things that are accepted as true in all disciplines and postulates to be things that are accepted as true in a particular discipline. Today, we would probably use those words interchangeably to be uh, just any statement that is accepted to be true. He distinguished between the concept of a number and a magnitude. A number was a discrete thing, like the natural numbers, and a magnitude was a continuous thing, like a length of a line. Uh, Aristotle was a giant in terms of his intellectual thought and, and even more so in terms of his long-lasting uh, influence on knowledge and culture. For better or worse, and it was a bit of both, Aristotelian ideas of knowledge in the world persisted in Europe and the Middle East through at least the 17th century. When I say better or worse, well, I mean, certainly he advanced a lot of things. Uh, he, he, uh, he advanced the idea of the scientific method a bit. He advanced the idea of, of investigation of the physical world, looking at uh, biology and mathematics, physics, and so forth. And of course, his work on logic was extremely influential. Uh, the worst part is the fact that he was so respected that any ideas that he had were kind of accepted as the truth, uh, even the ones that were wrong. And some, so sometimes some of his incorrect ideas were then uh, perpetuated for, for way too long, for centuries. Now, I mentioned that he went to Macedonia from Athens. So if you look at the map here, he was in Athens, which is right here. And he was going up in here to Macedonia at the court of Philip. And Philip's son, Alexander, was there. Uh, the Persians over in here, which would be centered more in what would be modern day um, Iran, had been at war with the Macedonians back and forth throughout through time, but but uh, Philip uh, Alexander's father had kind of gotten the upper hand and gone back and and taken over some of this territory. But when Alexander became the head of the country at a very young age, about twenty, he quickly became one of the greatest military commanders in history. Um, we're not talking about him because he was a mathematician. He was not. Uh, certainly he was probably had some basic training in math mathematics, but 
but he was a he was a conqueror really and a ruler and he was able successfully to physically lead his own army and conquer all of this territory look at all this some of the purple territories were able to uh, pay tribute and, and be basically be more or less annexed um, peacefully and then a lot of this orange yellow area was places that he actually conquered over different times and you can kind of see the the green arrows there are some of the paths of his uh, his routes that he went and amazingly enough he was able to conquer places and then get at least some of the folks that he conquered to turn around and join him in conquering even more places and he conquered this vast empire now one of the biggest in history but you know that alone is is amazing and important and, and influential but what was really influential for us in terms of the studying of the history of mathematics is this then expanded this Greek culture throughout this much much larger area it made uh, this connections with some of the other areas that we've been t studying uh, where Mesopotamia Egypt and even over into India over here where some earlier cultures had mathematics uh, and then the Greek culture kind of went through here we've discussed in an earlier video how eventually the Greek language becomes the language for this region especially this part over here in the uh, west of it and so that the, the the Greek culture uh, including Greek mathematics becomes spread throughout this particular area Greek ideas Greek philosophy uh, Greek philosophy gets mixed in with with uh, different religious groups like like uh, Jewish uh, uh, religion gets mixed in with uh, Greek uh, philosophy here over in this area over in here um, Hindu and and Buddhist religions get mixed in a little bit with some Greek philosophy as well so you've got a lot of things going on here where where the Greek philosophy is now spread and then if you'll notice these these cities uh, the names that are underlined almost all of them are called Alexandria these were cities that he founded and so the idea is to found new cities and each one of those he was trying to uh, make a Greek city there and uh, and city, centers of learning in every one of them and in particular uh, this one at uh, at the mouth of the uh, Nile River Alexandria uh, in Egypt becomes a, an extreme uh, intellectual center that we'll talk about in our next video uh, just before we go here I do want to note if you note how how young he was when he died um, was he 33 there years old when he died so from about 20 to about 33 and about you know somewhere 10 to 13 years in there he was able to amass this um, massive empire unfortunately for him and maybe for history he was uh, he invaded India and there he finally met uh, met defeat of his armies he was injured and eventually died uh, young there uh, from complications of those injuries uh, had he lived probably he could have uh, who knows if he would have continued to just conquer things or if he would have actually done what he you know, claimed he was wanting to do and that was set up a an empire that had a government uh, based on the Greek uh, ideals so in any event uh, at this point in history by the time of the death of Alexander the Great look what what's happening you've got Greek ideas Greek mathematics spreading throughout this region and coming in contact with lots of other uh, older knowledge as well and in particular you've got this city that's now founded at Alexandria that's going to become the center for knowledge for the, the next uh, uh, few centuries.